Thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks to the Blum Center. It's, it's a huge honor to be here in a building which is dedicated to eradicating poverty. As uh, Mandela said, we've created poverty. We can uncreate it. And to some extent, that's the theme of what I'm going to be talking about. We've created a whole array of problems. Now our job is to uncreate them. I'm a professor of a discipline that didn't exist when I went to college. The word sustainability entered the English language the year I graduated. Now, sustainability infers that if something is unsustainable, it's going to stop happening, whether we like it or not. The science is starting to become pretty scary. Global Biodiversity Outlook 3 by Dr. Tom Lovejoy, a whole lot of scientists based out of the Smithsonian. We're losing life. We're losing every major ecosystem on the planet. Coral reefs. Business as usual, there will be no living coral reefs on planet Earth, maybe as soon as 2050. The Amazon. This is a bit more serious. It's the Earth's lungs. And then the oceans are acidifying. The science was essentially replicated by the Stockholm Resilience Center, their uh, planetary boundaries work. They looked at 10 aspects of what it will take to have a sustainable Earth, sustainable way of life on Earth. You know, as George Carlin says, save the Earth, the Earth will be fine. It'll shake us off like a bad case of fleas. What we're talking about is save the humans. We are already beyond the planetary boundaries in at least three of these areas, the nitrogen cycle, we're nearing it in the phosphorus cycle, biodiversity, climate change. Today's number, we just hit 395 parts per million CO2 concentration. The historic 350, or the, the safe boundary, the prehistoric or pre-industrial 270 odd. So we are beyond the limits in many respects. Uh, when the economists say climate change is real, maybe it's real. The New Yorkers certainly had a rather rude surprise at LaGuardia in the subways. Now, in, in a sense, it shouldn't have been a surprise. Architecture 2030 pointed out that with sea level rise and with storm surges, you will flood a good bit of Manhattan. And that's about precisely what flooded. The trouble is it's a few years early. Oh, and uh, y'all are going to have a little problem in this part of the world as well. The IEA and OECD, OECD being the growth booster club of the rich nations, IEA being the International Energy Agency, two outfits that have always said, no limits, go for it, grow, 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 drill, baby, drill. In the last year, both came out and said, if world leaders don't put climate protection in place, by 2017, we lock in six degrees C warming. Sorry, they said, we've already locked in two degrees C. And anybody know where we're at now? Point eight. Point eight. Two degrees C is locked in. I mean, we're risking roasted earth. Africa will probably be hit the worst. Arid and semi-arid land extending species going extinct by 2020, perhaps as many as 250 million people with water shortages. Dadaab, the refugee camp in the north of Africa. 100,000 people. And Oxfam now reckons there are 18 million at risk of starvation in the north of Africa. Goldman Sachs says water is the petroleum of the next decade. Worldwide water use doubling every 21 years. Oh, and now there's fracking. We've figured out a new way to waste water. These things all interrelate. Food, water, energy. Remember, it was a food riot in Tunisia that kicked off the Arab Spring. And the UN says by 2030, we're going to need 50% more food, 45% more energy, 30% more water on a finite planet. Steve Chu, 
by the end of the century, California and the nation's salad bowl could be a dust bowl. And he said, I'm not quite sure what the cities are going to do. Yes, the science is uncertain. It's what science is, we argue. Here's the science I like on climate change. <laughs> and let me argue that it doesn't matter. Now, I say that with all deference to the great climate scientists, many of them on this campus, who are spending their lives trying to get the, their models to catch up with observed reality. But let's assume it's a hoax. Don't go to Vegas on the odds of that being true. But it turns out if all you are is a profit-maximizing capitalist, you'll do exactly what you'd do if you were scared to death about climate change because we know how to solve this one at a profit, and it's what the smart companies are doing. And that's the basic thesis of the book that Alice mentioned, The Way Out, kick-starting capitalism to save our economic ass. Because the leaders in bringing to market disruptive innovation around ways to reduce our emissions of carbon are financially outperforming the companies that don't. The companies that are the leaders in reporting to the Carbon Disclosure Project, this is a group of kids out of the UK who about 10 years ago started sending out to the biggest companies on earth a little survey, what's your carbon footprint? Who died and made them God? As you might imagine, for a few years, everybody ignored them. Well, they're backed by institutional investors with now $83 trillion in assets asking that question. If you want to go to the capital marketplace, you might want to answer their questions. So they're now keeping an index of the leading companies. They had twice the average total return, 2005 to 2011, right through the recession. These companies are winning. There are now 45 separate studies showing that the companies that are the leaders in environment, social, and good governance policy have, take your pick, 25% higher stock value, the fastest growing stock value, well protected from value erosion, even in a down economy. Harvard, sustainability is not the burden on the bottom line it was thought to be, it is the touchstone of all of innovation. And in the future, only companies that make it a goal will achieve competitive advantage. When those wild-eyed environmentalists at Goldman Sachs tell you that the companies that are leading have 25% higher stock value, there's a business case here. Why? We don't know. There have been efforts like John Elkington's triple bottom line. Companies should not only worry about profit, but also people and planet. Except when you look at it that way and you bolt people and planet onto profit, they become cost centers. Business doesn't like that. Why then are these 45 separate studies from Harvard, MIT, Sloan, all the big management consulting houses showing that the sustainability leaders are outperforming the sustainability laggards financially. We use an, a, a metric we call the integrated bottom line because we believe that a commitment to behaving more responsibly enhances every aspect of shareholder value. However, most of these are not on anybody's current accounting system. Now, if you cut your waste that goes right to your bottom line. That will show up, although you may, as a manager, not know what it was you did that gave you the extra performance. <clears throat> Reduction of risk. You better believe BP now wishes it had not taken a $500,000 savings with a shortcut that may cost it up to $20 billion. In some cases, companies lose their franchise to operate if they're not behaving sustainably. There are certainly a growing set of unbooked liabilities on carbon emitting companies. The ability to get and keep the best talent. Young people want to work for sustainable companies. Once you have them, driving innovation, labor productivity, 18% higher labor productivity in companies that have an engaged workforce. What engages workers? Being able to implement more sustainable practices as part of their day job. Market share, brand equity. There's a whole array of iconic brands that people are now turning to. Patagonia. 
Better managing your supply chain. Why is Walmart going green? They have 100,000 suppliers. By putting out the sustainability scorecard, they're better able to manage their supply chain. And most of all, to reduce the cost of distrust. Walmart's brand was falling off after they announced their green initiative. It's coming back. Now, yeah, Walmart needs to do something on the social side. And they're very clear. They are buying time to figure out what to do. They believe their entire business model is at risk. And they're trying to figure out what will the Walmart of the future be. Buying time by squeezing waste out. Not a bad first step. It's just not all the way there. But the companies that get it right will be the billionaires of tomorrow. Which is why we're seeing these reports coming out and sustainability certifications and my friend Yvonne getting the cover of Fortune magazine and, and Walmart going green. At the same time, we're seeing that entrepreneurs bringing new green jobs to market are really about the only new jobs being created. And in the last couple of years, the clean tech sector, the green economy, has dramatically outperformed the rest of the US economy. Indeed, here in California, green jobs grew three times as fast. Since 2006, the green jobs grown over 50% compared to the internet at 30%. And about a quarter of these green jobs are in manufacturing. We're starting to bring manufacturing back to the United States. And I'll be talking on Friday about some tools that we have of if you want to bring these jobs, how do you do it? What policy measures do you put in place in your community to make this happen? But the Kauffman Foundation has laid to rest that myth that it's the rich, it's the big companies that give us jobs. No, it's not. In all but seven years since 1977, the big companies have been net job destroyers. It's the little companies, it's the startups, it's the entrepreneurs. So people like Peter Diamandis are saying, let's entrepreneur our way out of these challenges. In nature, carbon is not the world's greatest poison. It's the building block of all of life. So little companies like Calera, misting seawater through the flue gas of a natural gas plant to make a cement-like compound because that's how nature, with coral reefs, makes limestone. Indeed, learning from Janine Benyus and this marvelous concept of biomimicry, how does nature do business? Nature makes a wide array of products and services very differently than we do. Nature doesn't run on big flows of fossil energy. It runs on sunlight. <coughs> Manufacturing near to something that's alive at ambient temperature with no waste, shopping locally, and just out. Earth's operating conditions, the biomimics are starting to draw from their study of how what nature does can inform how you manufacture something, to put forth a whole set of principles. Things like evolve to survive, replicate strategies that work. There's an idea. Resilience, low energy processes, Adapting to changing conditions. This is something humans are going to get to get really good at. We're a little past the ability to only mitigate climate change. We're going to get to adapt. As John Holdren has said many times, we will mitigate, adapt, and suffer. The relative proportions depend on how good we get at the early ones. Life-friendly chemistry. Nature does chemistry in water. Be locally attuned and responsive. Integrate development with growth. Janine has extracted these basic ones out, and I like the last one, tap the power of limits. Limits. Who said this? New limits to growth, reviving Malthusian fears the record high prices for commodities. It was the Wall Street Journal. And check out the date, six months before 
the 08 collapse. I wonder if there's a connection. Les Brown points out if China continues to grow economically at the rate that it has and uses resources as efficiently as the United States, it's now fourfold less efficient. By 2030, it's going to want more oil than the world now lifts or can ever lift. And more cars, coal, cotton, concrete, copper. OK, the future is not possible. When you realize the future is not possible, you're looking at what Royal Dutch Shell calls a driver of change. It's going to change. We may not now know how, but what this is is an enormous opportunity. Now, remember that nature innovates within limits. Remember that old book, Limits to Growth? It was wrong, yeah? Uh, maybe not. This was done about a year ago, published in the Smithsonian Magazine. Some people were so unkind as to go back and look at those original projections. Everybody said, well, we haven't collapsed yet. <laughs> No, but we're right on track. This is sobering. This, this is what we're up against. And remember, if something is unsustainable, it's going to stop. Jonathan Porritt, quoting Sir John Beddington, chief scientist of the United Kingdom, after the 08 collapse, suggested that there is a connection between the fundamental unsustainability of the way that we do business and the economic collapse. Sure enough, we had an economic collapse. I don't think any of us want to go through 08, 09 again. And what they're saying is the problem is that we have this economic stagnation. Consumer spending is down because jobs and wages are down. In fact, 70% of our economy runs on Consumption. OK, this is going to be a nice trick. How do we turn this around? And the FT was so unkind as to say that it's the zombie American consumer. We're not buying enough stuff. Again, if the way in which we manage businesses is based on an accounting system that is ignoring this integrated bottom line concept of how do, we, how do we drive enhanced core business value through sustainability. I think our total economic system is measuring the wrong things. What we're getting is this cascading collapse with governments at risk or falling. Greece, Italy, Spain, and unemployment. Spain at the top, Greece, the little dotted lines, various other countries. We're, we now have 200 million people unemployed, underemployed around the world. And we're told the answer is austerity. One thing that's now quite clear, austerity will drive down gross national product, gross domestic product. What is gross national product? It's how we do the accounting of the world. Are we getting better off or worse off? Schopenhauer said the task is not so much to see what no one has yet seen, but to think what no one has yet thought about that which everybody sees. We need a new paradigm. There is probably no way out of this paradigm that unless we all consume like crazy, we're going to crash the economy. Bobby Kennedy, years ago, said even if we erase material poverty, we have to confront the poverty of satisfaction, purpose, and dignity. He said, for too long, we've surrendered personal excellence and community values to the mere accumulation of things. 
Our gross national product counts air pollution and advertising and ambulances and jails, destruction of the redwood, napalm, nuclear warheads, armored cars, TV programs that glorify violence. It does not count the health of our children, the quality of education, the joy of their play, beauty of our poetry, the strength of our marriages, intelligence, integrity. It measures everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile. So what is this metric to which we are all enslaved, gross national product? It turns out it's like a heat gauge in a car. It measures the speed of throughput of stuff in the economy. Now, a heat gauge in a car is a useful measure, but as uh, Joe Stiglitz pointed out when he was asked by Sarkozy to think if there might be a better way to keep the national accounts of France, it's an inadequate measure if you want to drive from here to there. You need a few other gauges. And folk are starting to develop them. Gross national product has been steadily going up, but our happiness, as measured by the genuine progress indicator, the forerunner of which was created right here in Berkeley by a man named uh, Ted Halstead, genuine progress is holding pretty constant. And indeed, if you ask people, are you, are, are you better off, they will tell you fairly accurately. And so if you look around the world at happiness measures, compared to GDP, there's no correlation. The US is perhaps the biggest loser. Indonesia may be the biggest winner. Costa Rica is said to be the happiest country. In this country, Hawaii is said to be the happiest state. Hang loose. But we, we, if we're going to work our way out of the challenges facing us, and they are sobering and they are proximate, the stuff is staring us in the face, we are going to have to fundamentally rethink a lot of this stuff. Stop counting consumption of natural capital as if it were income. Herman Daly, who was the chief economist at the World Bank, said this when he quit the bank. He said, income is the maximum amount that a society can consume this year and consume the same next year. We are eating down our store of natural capital. That's what Global Biodiversity 3 showed us. National balance of payments accounting counts exports of depleted capital as if it were income. This is an accounting error. We're, we need to maximize the productivity of natural capital in the short run and invest in increasing it over the long run. Productivity of natural capital, is, capital said another way, is resource productivity. Move away from the ideology of global economic integration. Seek domestic production for internal markets. There's a very important role for government in doing this. It's a bit like a bad light bulb joke. How many economists does it take to screw in a light bulb? None. The free market will do it. <laughs> no. If you go back and read Adam Smith, Smith may have been the father of sustainability economics. The book that he was writing when he died was called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And it reads very differently than the neocon interpretation of the book, The Wealth of Nations. And in many ways, and again, as Schopenhauer says, we need to see what everybody, we need to think about what everybody sees in different ways. Smith was not calling for the maximization of personal wealth by greedy, self-actualizing bastards. He was calling for the wealth of nations. Because he said a wealthy nation can afford a military to keep people from coming to take what you have. In the theory of moral sentiments, 
He said the highest aspiration of a person should be to be happy, to be loved, to have a sense of belonging. There's a young man at Cambridge who's done his doctoral dissertation on what Smith actually said. Might not be a bad thing to go back and revisit it. There's a real role for faith, for asking these tough questions. Why are we here? What does life mean? Because all markets do, as powerful as they are, is allocate scarce resources in the short term. They were never intended to take care of grandchildren. That's our job, the job of a free people coming together in a democracy and saying, what kind of a future do we want? And so I was honored a year ago to be asked to the United Nations by the Prime Minister of the Little Kingdom of Bhutan, which with <laughs> no apparent arrogance said, we're going to reinvent the global economy. <laughs> oh, really? This is interesting. They want to replace the concept of gross national product with gross national happiness. <laughs> and happiness is not la 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 la, uh, let's all be cheery for the moment. It is total well-being of people and of the place, of the environment. What Bhutan is seeking to do is to put forth a new development paradigm to replace the Millennium Development Goals, which expire in 2015. Now, the MDGs were an interesting experiment. It was the first time that the UN has tried to put, set, measurable goals within a limited time frame. And they had some real success. They also had some fairly serious gaps, the uh, most obvious of which is brought forth by the uh, Global Biodiversity Outlook 3 and the planetary boundaries work. They, they were sort of forgetting that you, you set these development goals within the context of a healthy biosphere. At this meeting in April, 800 people from around the world came together to start hashing it out. I was asked and agreed to run the civil society working group. Over 50 leaders, again, from around the world of every segment of civil society that you can imagine, talking about how do we build a global movement to promote gross national happiness based on systems understanding, clearly transdisciplinary, and solution focused. So a month ago, we were asked to trek to Bhutan itself and flew in on the King's Airline, Druk Air, taken to Thimphu, the capital. Bhutan's a very poor country. And yet the king, the fourth king, a few years back, said to everybody, there are people in our country with more land than they need. I have more land than I need. Those of us who have more than 25 acres are going to give it up so that everybody in the country can have at least five acres. And we are going to have all of our agriculture be organic. And we are going to measure the success of our country on gross national happiness. They have a set of nine domains and then have set a bunch of indicators within them. And it's interesting, in Bhutan, even the Coke ads are about happiness. We were invited to the Prime Minister's Conference Center for a meeting of the International Expert Working Group for the New Development Paradigm. This was convened and the intellectual architecture put together by Dr. Robert Costanza, Dr. Ida Kubashevsky. The meeting was chaired by Jackie McGlade, who's run the, UN, uh, the EU Environment Agency. And again, it brought together experts from around the world to a building, th those of you who are in building science, 
Masonry building in a brilliant solar climate, it was much warmer outside than inside. The building was cold soaked. And so people were wearing every bit of clothing they had and then going outside whenever they had the opportunity. But again, amazing group of people. David Suzuki from Canada, Ashok Kosla from India, Francis Moore LePay from this country, Ernst von Weizsäcker from Germany, all to meet with the Prime Minister, the various ministers of Bhutan, to try to get at this question, as John de Graff puts it, what's the economy for? Do we exist to serve the economy? Or does the economy exist to serve us? You might remember after 9-11, we were invited to go shopping. And it was actually, as venal as it seems, it was actually right. Given that our economy is 70% based on consumption, if, if we suffer a shock, an economic shock, and we all behave as if nothing has happened, nothing will have happened, at least to the economy. In the short run, remember all of those scary bits of science that are staring us in the face. David Corton, who's a member of the team, said, we're looking at these two parallel realities, the world as defined by money and the living world. He's put forth a 10-point recovery plan based around radical relocalization, walkable, bikeable communities, make the Wall Street casino unprofitable, money created by the federal government, not by private banks. Yeah, <laughs> snicker. Bet me we're going to get that one through. But think about it. Banks, when they take your money, and loan out 90% of it at interest, are creating money out of nothing. And we all have to work harder in order to pay that interest for this money that the banks have just been allowed to create. So countries like Iceland, remember when um, in the 08 collapse, Iceland had been hugely leveraged to the Brits and the Dutch, and it collapsed, the Ice Icelanders said, let the banks collapse, default on the debt, and rebuild our economy. They have crowdsourced a new constitution. And part of that new constitution is that banks have to have higher reserve margins. They have to keep more of that money that you deposit with them, as opposed to loaning out 90% of it. This is an idea that's gaining now a lot of traction in Europe. Vandana Shiva of India, who's another member of the International Working Group, said you have a choice between living economies or killing economies or dying economies. And they say it has to be localized. McKibben, who's a, another member of the team, we live in a world where Walmart and McDonald's have replaced in God we trust with everyday low prices. He said, maybe the pendulum is swinging back. Jane Jacobs, however, reminded us that however sweet little local Vermont villages may be or little communities on Orcas Island where David Corton lives, most of the world lives in cities, mega cities, and increasing numbers of them. I'm heartened by a group called Slum Dwellers International that are building solutions that people who live at the very bottom can implement in these megacities. And they're funding it. They've put forth a whole new approach to how you do development, focused around women. In this country, it's being called the girl effect. If you give money to women, they tend to spend it to build the well-being of their families, their community, the whole economy, of upgrading slums, of partnerships, of inclusive cities. 
Bernard Amade, founder of Engineers Without Borders, says we need to make a transition away from this old linear mindset to a new mindset based on systems thinking, based on service to the earth, based on the, the, the understanding that we are going to innovate within limits. The technology is a tool, not our master. Technology is the answer, but what was the question? And I argued to the Prime Minister that there has to be a business case. That there is a business case that we are now finding with these big companies that the, again, the most profitable ones or the, 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 the faster growing ones are the ones that are implementing more sustainable practices. The first really to prove this was Ray Anderson who said, what's the business case for ending life on Earth? He set what he called Mission Zero. Zero impact, zero footprint. And his emission, the company's emissions are down 82% in absolute tonnages. Waste is down, renewable energy use is up. And check it out, profits are up two thirds. Excuse me, sales are up two thirds, profits doubled. Ray tragically died last year. Huge loss. And I was asked by Joel McCower, who's the new Ray Anderson? And I said, Paul Pullman. Pullman runs this little uh, startup called Unilever. In 2011, Paul announced he was not going to report quarterly to Wall Street. His profits went down 10% immediately. And he said, I respect those of you who have sold as human beings, but if you believe that my managing your company on a short term, on a quarterly basis is good for the building of core business value, thank you, I don't want you as my owners. His stock value is now up 17%, his profits are doubled. He's announced Unilever's sustainable living plan. <clears throat> cut their impact in half by 2020. That's not quite as ambitious as Ray's work at Interface, but then Ray started back in the 90s. And uh, Unilever's a little bigger. Source 100% of every feedstock that comes from something grown from sustainable agriculture. I said to the Prime Minister of Bhutan, you might want to talk to Unilever. And lift a billion people out of poverty. Not a bad goal. Why are these companies making these kinds of pledges? I know in Ray's case, it was a moral experience. He read Paul Hawkins' book, Ecology of Commerce, and he described the experience as a spear in his chest. And to him, it was an epiphany that business, was, business as conventionally done was killing the planet. And he said, my company is going to be the first company of the next industrial revolution. I've not met yet with Paul, so I don't know why he did it as a human being, but I do know that it's good business. 96% of young workers want to work for a green company. And I think we're at this interesting time in which those of us who have been doing this work since we were wild-eyed young activists, are now starting to take over institutions, are starting to come into power. And behind us is a whole cadre of young people who are looking at the future and saying, do I have a future? We're going to change this. We may be at this moment in time when dramatic changes can happen. Gandhi called it a teachable moment when a window opens and you can tr tremendously transform everything. Bhutan has called for a new Bretton Woods conference, which we all said, well, it'll have to be named Bhutan Woods. And my job now 
is to, with uh, Josh Farley, the ecological economist, by June, is to lay out the intellectual architecture for a new economic paradigm. And one of the reasons I wanted to have this talk here with you is to say, help! <laughs> we need help. We need your ideas. And I've laid out some of the thinking. We've got this international expert working group. But in truth, when it came down to it and we actually sat down and started putting fingers to computer keys, the answers were pretty thin. So if any of you are working on anything that pertains to this, if you know anybody here on campus, if you know anybody anywhere about the wild world, please, I can use their ideas. Because I guarantee you I am not smart enough to do this on my own. And we are up against some pretty formidable forces. Billy McKibben has pointed out the math. The fossil industries own 2,795 gigatons of carbon fuel that's still in the ground. Their business model is to burn it. The Earth can withstand maybe 565 more gigatons of release. This is what we're up against. Unless we stop them. And stopping them is not going to happen by reports written for the government of Bhutan or indeed the UN. It's going to happen when people come together and demand that it stop. And so Bill is calling for college campuses to divest ownership in fossil industries. And this is something you guys can do here on campus. You're doing it? Uh, it's happening. It's happening. Power to you. Yeah, it, it is not going to be an easy fight. We are in the position of South Africa when they started trying to overturn apartheid, when we tried to overturn slavery in this country. All of the historic campaigns to make the world a better place took struggle. Some of you will have known this man who walked the Berkeley Hills, first executive director of the Sierra Club, founder of Friends of the Earth, Earth Island Institute, David Brower, my old boss, who said, what do we want the Earth to be like 50 years from now? Let's do a little dreaming. He said, aim high. Navigators have aimed at the stars for centuries. They haven't hit one yet, but because they aimed high, they found their way. This is the only place in all the universe we know of where there is life. And we're the only ones who can take care of it. So again, I invite you, I implore you, if you have ideas about how we transform the global economy, I want to hear them. Thank you very much. And we should have, what, uh, 15 minutes or so for questions? One in the back. And we're, we're recording this, so if we could, um, I didn't use it earlier, but if you wouldn't mind using the microphone. Thank you very much uh, for the talk. My name is Pierce Gordon. I'm part of the Energy and Resources Group here on campus. Um, how are you doing? Excellent. Uh, so specifically dealing with what you just brought up about divestment, um, I wanted to know, I'm not sure if there's anybody that would know better in the room, if there are, even though they change around consistently, um, amalgamated statistics for how intricately involved, how much money is in different schools at different times um, from um, oil companies or from specific fossil fuel companies um, so that people can have an idea of what would be the impacts for particular versions of divestment. Do you know better than I do? Uh, maybe from Berkeley. Yeah, let's bring the microphone up. Yeah, because it's being filmed. Uh, so, um, specifically for Berkeley, uh, a, a few weeks ago, 
um, uh, some very talented undergrads passed through the um, ASUC here, uh, the, the student government, that we are going to, that, that they pass a resolution that UC Berkeley should divest from uh, fossil fuel companies. Um, with that being said, the only real power uh, the ASUC has is over their own money, so they've started investing, like divesting their several millions of dollars from uh, from the fossil fuel companies. Um, that is being um, also uh, done in conjunction with movements. Uh, I think Swarthmore um, is involved on on the East Coast, and I think UC Irvine. Don't quote me on that. Two other UCs that I, I have voted to to do this. Um, I would estimate that the the heart of your question is how much of an impact does that make? I'm going to say financially, I would estimate that not that much uh, in terms of global investments in the fossil fuel companies. But um, I don't think that it was, uh, I think it would be of the same magnitude as divestment from the Vietnam War was in the, in, when, when students did it before. Um, the vote already happened, um, and we, we, the ASUC has voted to divest and started doing that. Um, it, right now, the emphasis is upon us to pressure uh, the, the regents to follow through. It's a tough one because some of the fossil industries return outrageous profits. Exxon was the most profitable company ever in history. And if your mental model of your fiduciary duty as an investor is to maximize quarterly profits. It is hard to say we're going to sell a stock that is paying a dividend or that is itself going up at that kind of a rate. It's a question, though, if the role of a university is to educate the next generation if what you are doing with your investment policy is essentially ensuring that there will not be a next generation or one after that, then maybe it's time to take a little less of a return and say invest in a Patagonia, which has been growing at a rate of 25 to 30% even through the, the 08 collapse. There are companies around that are doing the right thing that have the same kind of financial metrics. But yes, it's a scary thing to do. It's a scary thing to ask the regions to do. The good news is socially responsible investing is actually returning very attractive rates, again, even in the downturn. So people who moved their money into screened portfolios for moral reasons are finding that they're getting a very healthy return. But I don't know the exact answer to your question. It would be a good, good thing to find out. I have a question for you. Yep, Laura Nader, Anthropology. Thank you very much. The most discouraging thing you showed us was the Coca-Cola sign. Do they really sell Coca-Cola in a country that says that it wants to have healthy people? Yes, they do. Evidently, they had a, uh, they certainly had a Coca-Cola truck. Bhutan is starting to ban various kinds of advertising, and there's a vigorous debate underway in Bhutan about junk food and about limiting people's access to things like Coca-Cola. As you might imagine, companies like Coca-Cola do not like movements like this. And it's one of the reasons Coke has invested in companies like Minute Maid and Dasani, uh, hydration services. And it's one of the real challenges, as, as you know so well, how do we take these behemoth companies and transition them to something that serves life rather than destroys it? It, it, it is, I think, a tough ask to the Cokes and the Walmarts, please just go away. The, 
The Indians, indeed, uh, have been suing them. And again, this is this question of franchise to operate. And company, co companies, countries that take them on are like student groups that say we're going to divest. It's a shot across the bow to these companies. And the more of us do it, the more the companies, the faster the companies will make this kind of a transition. Yes, please. Oh, sorry, you're next. Sorry. Um, hi, uh, Linda Gross, and I, I teach uh, fashion and sustainability at California College of the Arts. Um, and I, my question for you was, um, well, there's a couple of things. I, I guess a, a couple of short comments, hopefully short. Um, just back to the person's um, comment from UC Berkeley, I think one of, one of the issues that we have when he said, you know, how much of an impact are we having? Not very much. And, it, and surely what we need to do is build a new lexicon or new measures for what we're doing. And certainly in, in design, we are measured by the number of units our designs sell, you know, and the profits that come back to the, the companies that we work for. And yet we can educate, inspire, engage people to change, you know. So there's different measures that straight away we need to be putting in place so that we can talk in that language so that we're not compared with an old model. So that's one thing. And then I wanted, you know, I understand, you know, Patagonia comes up a lot as a, as a good company and certainly in a certain model of company that's selling individual units for sale at increasing volumes and speeds. It's, what, it's a good example. And I wonder if we can start to create a bucket that completely new models can go into, like, for example, a Goodwill Industries model, where they take the waste, they resell it, 85% of the profit that comes from that goes back in to get people who are underserved in the community into good paying jobs. So they pull things out of the, um, out of the landfill, people off welfare, it benefits more individuals, community, all at once, and it's not this either or, it's not 1% for the, for the planet. The bigger they grow, the, bigger the, the, the more beneficiaries there are, and the more everybody benefits. And that's the kind of inspirational model, I think, you know, that really, it just completely, it leapfrogs. Um, so I just wanted to put out there, too, just the role for design and CCA coming together with business folks to sort of leapfrog, you know, these ideas and innovations. Back in the day, yes. Um, inspired by, you know, by Paul back at Esprit, um, where David Brower spoke and so on in the, in the late 80s, early 90s. So thanks for your inspiration. And, you know, it's, it's going on to the next generation of young designers. So. Well, thanks for all that you do. The, uh, the CCA program is, uh, the, uh, their business program is run by Nathan Shedroff, who is a brilliant designer who was uh, one of my students. Uh, this is, to some extent, what Ashok Kosla is doing in India, building businesses that empower people in the community so that the bigger the business gets, the more impact it has in the community. And indeed, I agree with you. That's, uh, his company is Development Alternatives, a very good model. Hi. Uh, my name is Alex Legata. So I don't know if you heard there was a fascinating debate. I believe it took place at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco between Bill McGibbon and the former VP for Shell Oil. And in the beginning, towards the beginning of the debate, the, uh, Bill McGibbon is talking all about climate change and his latest article on the terrifying new math. And the former <laughs> vice president for Shell Oil says, you know, I'm not a scientist and you know, the burning of fossil fuels with rising CO2 contents, I'm really not sure there's a relationship. And Bill McGibbon <laughs> said to him, you know, for you to say this in this public forum, in this day and age, quite frankly, is unacceptable. And he got a standing ovation. So, so that was a provocative moment. And then towards the end of the debate, which is when the debate got really interesting for me, um, the former vice president of VP acknowledged, he's like, yes, we know there's a problem. We know there's a big problem. 
He's like, but people are not going to change their ways. People are going to drive their cars. And so we want a piece of the action. And that was, and it was essentially the two truths, the dichotomy. You know, people are not going to give up their cars and that lifestyle that they've grown accustomed to. And f therein lies the challenge, I think. But an interesting little tidbit, just I just got my PG&E bill last night, and it was cheaper. And I was like, why is it cheaper than most months? And they said, because you have declined your usage of energy, we're giving you a rebate. So we've deducted you know, 12% from your electric bill. And so I just had the epiphany right now, what if car insurance companies or, you know, for if you can show them you are driving less or consuming less oil would also give you a rebate? I don't know. But In I the UK, AXA does just that. Oh, well, that's wonderful. The insurance industry is one of these industries that is interesting because they are so at risk from climate change. And so a man named Jeremy Leggett, who uh, used to be with Greenpeace, I think he's now in the UK government, um, is, has been working with the insurance industry, getting them to, to realize we ought to be doing everything in our power to encourage our customers to drive less, to use alternate modes of transit, to do anything that reduces the risk to us of climate change. Yeah, it's perfect. I'm Tom Lent, uh, policy director for the Healthy Building Network, um, also an ex-Greenpeacer <laughs> like Jeremy. Um, and it's segueing really from what you talked about and what you're, what you're both talking about, I think signaling people, getting, getting information to people's hands is vastly underrated. And, you know, we tend to dismiss, say people are never going to give up their cars. They don't really care when it comes right down to it. But you know, we're having a big test of that in the, in the building material industry right now where, where we're we're campaigning for uh, radical transparency, basically, on, on the toxics issue, which is the core issue my organization works in, getting the toxics out of building materials. Um, on the principle that people who are designing buildings and, 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 and owning buildings want to know what's in their, in their materials and will act differently. We'll make, you know, we'll make different purchases. We'll get into, actually we'll get into conversations with manufacturers about how they design and their materials if they have the information about whether you know, there's a carcinogen in the glue that holds this table together. Um, and Short it, answer, yes. Yeah, and, and that's what we're seeing. I mean, we've, we've seen, you know, we've gone through several iterations already in the, build, in the building industry with different, different parts of this, and now we're taking it to another level. I think that the same thing can work in climate change and elsewhere that people, people do care both about their personal impact and about their global impact, and, and as much as anything, it's just not being able to see how your, how your decisions, whether it's a small purchase at the store or whether it's a large decision about, um, about where your business is going or how your house is gonna be designed, that can, can make a difference. Thank you for what you're doing. In the back, three of them. Hi, uh, my name is Neil Dasgupta. I just have a really quick question for you. This concept of green jobs and quantifying them in metrics came up throughout your talk. And I see a lot of different interpretations in the definition of green job. And I was wondering if you could give us some insight into how you choose which ones to believe and what sort of error bars there are on these sort of metrics. In many senses, these are very conservative numbers because there are two great categories of green jobs. There are the jobs doing something that greens the world. So either dealing with recycling or getting toxics out of buildings or building solar panels. And then there are the ordinary day jobs that most people do where they, either because their company makes a commitment to it or they personally make a commitment to it, they begin to green what they're doing at work. And those jobs are not counted here. These count only making solar panels and building green buildings and recycling and a few other industries. So these are dramatically conservative numbers. Does that help? Pew Center has done some excellent work detailing out precisely what is a green job and what they count. 
Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned the stock market, you mentioned Unilever as one good example of a company that refuses to uh, report every quarterly you know, period. I think there is our biggest problem. Um, I believe that a majority of the people that put money in the stock market are not really investing, they're gamblers. Yes. And if we can turn this around and be really, really brutal and say, when you give money to a company, it's because you believe that the company does something good, they will produce something with it, rather than getting short-term return. So let's try to change the way we uh, tax capital gains. Maybe it's 90% if it's less than one year, right? And maybe after 10 years it goes down to zero. And let's stop all the derivative things and all these quick transactions. So if, if you make money within milliseconds, you, you pay 99.9% .9 to the government. Then you have some capital. The problem, of course, is while we see that would be a good thing, how are we going to make this change? Because the people that are in power are the ones that exactly make their power and their money from that particular system. And they have every interest to keep it that way. And that's where I'm kind of at the loss. You know, how, even though many people see what should be done, how can we possibly get it done when we live in a democracy where it's not one person, one vote? It's like one dollar, one vote. Yes, we have a market <laughs> democracy. I had a very interesting talk in Bhutan with Ernst von Weizsäcker. He uh, was in the German Bundestag. He ran the Wuppertal Institute before that, author of the new book out, Factor Five. He and we collaborated on a book called Factor Four, and Ernst has taken it even further. He said what the Europeans are aiming at now is a provision where Every year you take the efficiency gains of the year before and add a tax on use of whatever that resource was equal to the percentage of the efficiency gain. He says in the first industrial revolution we ratcheted up labor productivity and wages. As productivity went up, the workers demanded higher wages, and we got to more or less a livable wage for a while. He said, how about we do this now with efficiency? The EU and China do a deal to put this in place. Both governments are looking for more revenue. Both governments are looking to drive increases in productivity. And just ignore the US for the, the meanwhile. And over time, five to 10 years, it will be demonstrated that this drives innovation, it provides revenue for governments, it incredibly drives resource productivity. Without resource productivity, China is in very serious trouble, and it knows it. And then the US companies that are increasingly being competitively disadvantaged will say, hey, wait, wait, we want in on this deal too and it will bring pressure on the U.S. to begin to do something more intelligent. You're exactly right. If we had some ham, we could have some ham and eggs if we had some eggs. <laughs> if we could get the kind of policy that we need, we might not need it. And how do you get a Congress that is so deadlocked that it, it'll allow a damn sequester to go into place, which it itself said it put in place to force it to do something, I mean, what hope do we have of a new economic transformation? So it's one of the reasons that I'm excited that this group is an international expert working group. We now have the ability across a wide array of nations to look at what policy initiatives could be put in place in Europe, in China, in India, in Africa, in Latin America that can begin to walk this forward in ways that are very visible to the U.S. companies. And this was, again, my point to the Prime Minister. Until we get the companies at the table, we're not going to get the kind of change that we need to have. And so a brilliant woman named Amy Christensen, who used to be over at Google.org, is working with the Prime Minister to bring, in 2014, to bring the best corporate leaders to Bhutan to bring the corporates into this conversation. Maybe then we'll get some action, eh? Okay, two more questions. Claire. Oh. Thanks very much. Um, this, is, this is, you can tell, inspiring everyone to sort of uh, 
think forward and move ourselves. My name is Rob Knapp. I'm in physics and sustainable design. Um, I, and I want to sort of go from the grand level you were just talking about now back to the sort of uh, uh, grassroots and micro. Um, the mention about healthy building products uh, dovetails with what I think is one of the most important um, developments now, which is an increased interest by all of us in where things come from. We've run an economy based on arm's length. I don't need to know, do I like this thing? That's all I need to know. But in fact, these days, we're beginning to realize we do want to know where things come from. And technically, with barcodes and big league computing and so forth, channeling that information and figuring out where things came from and what's in them is now available. We all, as users, have a giant task about what do we want to know. The world is, could drown us in information. But I think that's to, to promote that uh, is one of the most promising global developments that's available to us. Um, and to just learn how to use this information uh, and make those decisions about purchasing or about preferences or about uh, uh, policy and practice that um, will be the micro steps out of which the transformation is made. Thank you. Thank you. I'm making a note of that. Okay. that uh, so. There's a company in Egypt called Sakim that does this. They, uh, they're the only company ever to win the Right Livelihood Award. They um, are committed to lifting people out of poverty. They grow feedstocks for fiber, for cosmetics, chemicals, in a very barren part of the Egyptian desert. They provide 100% education, health, including a four-year university, health care, child care for all of their workers and their families, and are a company that is organized around how do you lift people out of poverty. Every product they make comes with a little code. And there are stores in Europe where you can key in in a kiosk what that code is, and up pops the story of where that thing came from. And now with RFID chips and with, with barcodes, we're much better equipped to do that. There's a brilliant new book out by a man named Jonas Sachs of Front Range Studios called Winning the Story Wars, Why Those Who Tell and Live the Best Stories Will Rule the Future. I gave a copy to the Prime Minister. So I think we uh, should give the economist, or at least I don't know how many economists we have in the room, but one of the economists in the room, the last question. You know, your talk reminded me of the economic paradox that in hell, the GNP is almost infinite because everything's a scarce resource and everything you, you get adds to the economy. In heaven, the GNP is zero because everything's free and available. <laughs> Uh, nice. Claire Brown from Economics. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful talk, and thank you for all the work you're doing. Um, you know, as an economist, we know that people are extremely sensitive to prices, especially in the U.S. And so we, and we have many faculty on campus who are showing how sensitive consumers are to the price of gas and energy and so forth. Um, and we can use this in the short run. For example, in Pricing, the, we let guys, gas prices go up and down. It really destabilizes the economy. And so then we sit around and say, oh, this is awful. We got to like keep prices low. N no, no, the economist says actually what we need to do is when gas prices go up, Americans do all the right things. They buy smaller cars, they drive less. They do the things that we think they should be doing. So the economist says what we, some of us, not all of us, of course, but some of us, so what we should do is when gas prices go up, we help raise them gradually, but we never let them fall. And so the government can come in and say, okay, now gas is $5 a gallon or six or whatever it is. And then whatever the difference is just becomes a national tax. And that would really help the macro economy because it would really help stabilize consumption. And so there are lots of good reasons that economists would argue for that. That's for the short run. But here's what I really want to push as an economist, is we also know, and going back to Smith and others, Adam Smith and others, um, that consumption falls into basics or necessities, variety, or status. Status is luxuries. And the anthropologists tell us, oh, well, we, we buy status goods because we mark ourselves. It's our identity. We separate ourselves. We show how great we are. 
but it doesn't, and that's in the US economy. But in other economies, let's say you're more Buddhist, like in Bhutan, then if we could rearrange our culture and our value system so that with status, the way that you mark yourself actually is by doing good. I think finally Bill Gates was getting the message. And that's where I think we really could start talking about how to change the culture. That, and, and status goods, by the way, even very low income people buy status goods. Um, we, we have a lot of studies on that. But if we could talk a whole lot about what is status or how do we mark ourselves or how do we look at people and, with admiration, then I think we could. And, and the work you're doing starts and the other people does that, it's starting to do that, but I think in the work the students are doing, you know, on sustainability, it starts to do that. And so as we get out of this recession, I would really like to push all of us to think about, let's redefine status sure. and social marking and sort of why we admire people or think they're great. So thank you for all you're doing. You're very welcome. Uh, that Bill Gates got into this in part because of Ted Turner. Uh, Ted decided to uh, challenge all billionaires to give away a significant portion of their proceeds. And I was with him at Davos when he was about to announce this. He said, I feel a little like the uh, young prince who's just inherited his dad's harem. I know what to do. I don't know where to start. <laughs> and I think in a bit that's where we are in this challenge of reinventing a new economic paradigm. There's so many things to do. Which of them are the really powerful levers? So again, please. Uh, I'll put back up the uh, NatCap website. You can write me there. I'm, a, I'm here on campus until we think, what, the 15th? Yeah. I'd love to chat with you or other people that you think um, are interested in this sort of thing. Please get involved. Thank you. Thank you.